Hi everyone, my name is Erin Hodson and I'm an Extension Entomologist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And today we're shooting a video to learn more about corn root. Mm. There's some adults uh, feeding three, four, five. So there's a couple of points I want to stress today. The first is how to recognize western and northern corn rootworms so you know what they look like. We're going to talk about a scouting plan for the larvae and the adults. And then with that scouting plan, we're also going to highlight economic thresholds for both the larvae and the adults. And then we're going to follow up, uh, lastly, talking about a resistance management plan for corn rootworm and some strategies that you can try to minimize the impact of rootworm in your cornfields. Okay, so what we have here, we're at Feel, which is a demonstration a research farm just west of Ames in central Iowa. And it's a place where we have a lot of field days and they let us do kind of crazy stuff uh, with kind of goof plots. And one thing that we have here is a variety screening, looking at different transgenics for corn rootworm and some above ground traits for caterpillars. So the, the, the goal for this uh, next segment is to dig up some plants, show you how to do that, and how to look for root injury caused by corn rootworm larvae. So let's go. So ideally a good time to start looking for node injury is when you first start seeing adults. We saw the first adults in at Feel last week and so that is an indication to me that the larvae have wrapped up their feeding cycle and we're able to assess root injury while it's fresh. So today is July 2nd and so we want to be doing this as early as possible to assess injury while it's fresh and uh, we won't have any regrowth that some hybrids can exhibit and kind of cover up that injury. So, ooh, it's looking spiky. This looks kind of sad, huh? So what you want to do is, is take uh, a corn plant that you want to sample and use a, a I like flat sided spade or shovel and kind of dig a large area around the plant so that you're getting the majority of the larger roots and some of the smaller roots that develop as well. So you can see it just kind of pops up. The ground is very dry, so uh, that makes it harder. And then you can, if, if the ground is dry, just kind of gently shake off that excess soil. And yeah, lost a few roots there, that's okay. But you see that root ball there, um, and it's pretty small root system, actually. There's a lot of things working against it this year. Yeah. And so you can just use your hands uh, to kind of get a sense of the, the root formation and if it looks like it's where it should be or if it looks like there's not very many roots there. This looks pretty sad. You can see the feeding though. Yeah. And we'll clean this off and show the feeding better, but you can see that these roots yeah. here are pruned. You can see some scarring and yeah. pitting and things like, like that. Like right here. And that's you know, that, that's a larvae that's tunneled inside one of those larger roots. So ideally you'd like to take a sample uh, every couple acres in a field. So depending on how large your field is, you'd want to sample a few plants, uh, you know, the more the better, just to kind of see where you're at. So not right at the field edge where you park your truck, but you kind of almost want to do a checkerboard style sampling uh, just to get an assessment of root activity, or sorry, larval activity throughout the field. Basically don't cut too close to the bottom of the plant, you're trying to get, what, 10 inches deep so that you capture the majority of those roots. Gently shake. So um, you can use your hands to get off some of those root balls. And then we will power wash if you have access to a power washer or soaking them in a bucket overnight to uh, see some of the more fine fine root feeding. You can see a western corn rootworm adult right there. Interesting. You can see just like all this is not normal, right? All that type of feeding. There should be more substantial root formation here. So as the, the larvae get older, they can consume more root tissue. And so that's where plants become unstable. They can fall over. But also they're not able to take up the water and nutrients like they normally could. And that's when a plant really starts to suffer because they won't have the, the yield potential without a proper root system. This is not, it doesn't look normal to me because you can see like that hole right there. Oh yeah. To me that looks like rootworm feeding. Do you think that this is rootworm here? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, see how they're discolored? Mm -hmm. The tips are discolored? Mm -hmm. And they're just not getting, uh, this probably won't get any longer, you know, so they've, that tissue has been eaten away. Mm -hmm. So, larva. oh, cool. Yeah, so this is a corn rootworm larva, and I would say, you know, it's, it's probably just over a quarter of an inch long, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, it's unique compared to some other larvae that you find in the soil. It kind of looks like it has a head on each side. So it has like a brown head or brown head capsule and a brown colored butt. And so uh, you can see it's, it's actually pretty big. Um, so this is wrapping up its feeding cycle and is soon going to pupate in the soil. Cool, nice find. So yeah, before the silks come out, the adults are really hungry. And so they're gonna scrape that top layer of the leaves off for food until uh, pollination occurs and they, you know, they prefer to feed on pollen uh, from the silks. So this uh, is sometimes, sometimes what you'd see early in the season for those first adults that come out of the ground, uh, some of that injury on the, on the leaves. Hi, my name is Ashley Dean and I am also an extension entomologist with Iowa State University. And Erin just talked a little bit about larval feeding and how to scout for that. But as you can tell just from what she was showing us, it's quite a lot of work to do the larval uh, root digs and things like that. So another thing that you could do is scout for adults um, after they emerge kind of through the reproductive stages of corn growth, you can scout for adults using sticky cards. So I have one here, and so this is just a two-sided Farrakhan sticky card. It's not baited with anything, so it's just the color that attracts the uh, adult corn rootworms. And we can use these uh, by setting up a transect within your field. And depending how big your field is, you'll want to have multiple transects to get the best possible sample. But you could set up you know, four to six or eight sticky traps per transect, and then two or three transects per field. And that will give you a good idea of adult activity in the field for that year. So there's a, a threshold that has been established for sticky cards. That is, if you catch more than two adult rootworm beetles, so that could be either species, so two beetles per trap per day, um, you'd want to do something different the next year. Oh, there's one on your neck. Maybe? Is there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, did I get it off? Yeah, so on this specific trap, I can count three adult western corn rootworms. So there's one here, one here, it's kind of harder to see, and then one here. And all of these look to be males, and so western corn rootworms are, to me, the most distinct corn rootworm um, of the two. So there's westerns and northerns. The westerns look like this, so they're kind of yellow and they have uh, black stripes and with female, with western corn rootworm, it's easier to identify different sexes based on how they look. Um, so the western corn rootworm uh, females have distinct stripes and then the male western corn rootworms kind of look like a black smudge most of the time because the stripes kind of bleed together. And we don't have northerns out right now, but the northerns are usually tan when they first emerge and they turn kind of a lighter green and then they don't have any distinct markings so they're just kind of fully light green um, after they've emerged and it's a lot harder to determine sex just based on how they look. So after you have a couple plants uh, that you're assessing for root injury in the field um, you're going to try and knock off as much soil gently as you can but to really see some of that initial pitting or feeding, tunneling into those nodal roots, we want to clean off a little bit more dirt if possible. So if, if you have access to a high power washer, that'd be great. Otherwise, you can soak in buckets overnight to try and loosen that up. So that's, we're gonna show you how to do that. And um, Ashley here is gonna show us how she takes one of those root systems and you're just gonna gently kind of wash it in there. And again, if it's really uh, muddy, you can let it soak overnight. Sometimes if you do this, uh, say in June, you'd be able to see larvae float to the top. I think we're gonna be a little late in the season to see that today. Um, but you know, you're gonna be able to see some of that discoloration and root pruning. Oh yeah. Yeah, so you wanna get in there as much as you can and all these tips are gone. And that's just be, it's just, lar it's just tissue that's been consumed by the larvae. 
So um, to whatever degree you have to wash, kind of agitate the water to get that soil loosened up. And it'd be important to distinguish this earlier in the season from things like pathogens from, for seed and seedling issues. Uh, there's also some fields that have nematode injury. It wouldn't look quite as extensive as that. Sometimes you have other issues that are not pest related, like soil compaction, planting too fast, planting when it's too wet, planting too shallow, and you don't have proper root formation. So you'd want to be able to distinguish that from corn rootworm larvae feeding. Oh, are you seeing some larvae pop up there? There's one floating right down in there. I knocked it down, oh. but it's in there. If you do have access to a high pressure washer, you can take root systems and just try and loosen up the soil. I mean, when, it, when it's severe as this, it's pretty obvious that you have a lot of root feeding and, and larval activity. But if you happen to be on the leading edge and you're unsure if you have a problem or not, you're gonna see a little bit of the tips turning brown or some little pits that are formed. Uh, this is quite extensive. So what does this mean? Okay, you're digging these roots, you're spending all this time uh, preparing the, them, getting as much soil off as possible. Uh, Iowa State and generally the ind industry standard is to assess root injury on the zero to three scale. So uh, larvae tend to focus their feeding on the nodes four through six. Each node uh, depends a little bit on the genetics, but each node is going, going to have approximately 10 roots. So for each root that is consumed uh, back to your first knuckle, which is about an inch and a half, you're going to count that, and each root counts. So if you were to have 10 roots pruned back like this, that's a score of a one. 20 roots would be a score of a two, and 30 roots would be a score of a three. And you can have increments, you can have a one and a half. So what do these numbers mean? It only takes two to three of these roots being pruned back to cause economic injury. So this is a point at which this corn plant is experiencing losses in bushels per acre. When you have drought stress conditions like we're experiencing here in 2021, uh, this, this is certainly an, at a point at which economic loss occurs, but uh, the drought stress compounds that potential uh, yield losses as well. So this is a really important benchmark. It only takes two or three. You may not notice that you have injury above ground if you have adequate moisture. So the plant may look healthy, may be standing for the entire season, may not ever uh, get goose nectar lodged. Another important benchmark is if you have five roots anywhere on the root system, that's an injury score of a 0.5. This is what the EPA would consider unacceptable. So you should never see this amount of injury if you're growing a pyramided corn hybrid, which I think uh, if most people are using corn rootworm BT, it usually is a pyramid. So that's two or more traits in the same genetics. So this is considered unacceptable. So uh, whether or not you wanna call that resistance or unexpected injury, there's a lot of words you can put on that, but you should not be seeing that type of injury in the field. So this root, this particular root sample here is, is probably close to a three. You have very few roots of the, these large nodal roots that are above an inch and a half. They've all been pruned away. And so you have some of these smaller roots, but you can see you can see that it makes this plant like very unstable. So it's likely to lodge if we have severe weather and it's not getting nutrient and water uptake. So with each node that is pruned away, it's approximately 15% yield loss. So this plant on top of being drought stressed is probably close to 40, 45% yield loss. So later in the season, this corn plant is gonna look really sad. The air is going to be small and it's not going to be at ideal uh, yield, yield projections like we want. So this is where some of the, the questions about what to do when you see this type of injury is some of the things that we're gonna talk about next. Okay, our last topic today is talking about some rootworm management options. If you find that you have high injury scores or you're trapping for adults and you're noticing a lot of adult activity, that is a red flag that you should be doing something different. And really the only times that we see really poor performance of some of the transgenic technologies is when we're in continuous corn production. So the single most effective thing that a farmer can do in Iowa is not grow corn for a year to break up that life cycle. So this is really hard for farmers, especially if they have animals or some disease problems for soybean uh, or, or ethanol, if they're by ethanol plants. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people want to grow corn. 
But if you have declining yields and you're continuing to put more inputs in for corn rootworm, know that that pressure is only going to intensify the longer you grow corn. So even breaking up the life cycle of corn rootworm every two, three, four years is going to offer you a lot of flexibility the next time you do grow corn. So besides cr uh, crop rotation, that's the most effective thing that we can do. Uh, a pyramided BT transgenic is something that we also recommend. So uh, this is something that has a some issues with performance and crop protection in Iowa, so you'd not want to solely rely on BT in Iowa anymore, you'd want to mix it up with crop rotation. There are some, there are some people that uh, have access to soil applied insecticides, and in some soil conditions and some moisture conditions, uh, soil applied insecticides can be really effective. And so this just takes a little trial and error. Some parts of Iowa, this strategy really holds up, but it's not for everybody. And so uh, it does take special equipment and things like that, but really after the corn is planted, there aren't a lot of rescue treatments that we recommend as consistently profitable. There are other strategies that farmers are using, but really once the corn is in the ground, uh, there, are, there aren't really a lot of effective strategies that we can use to uh, minimize the larval injury or the adult emergence. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to talk about, which is new, it's a novel technology for the Corn Belt, is the use of RNAi technology. So this is also a transgenically incorporated product in with the corn genetics. And I'm certainly not a geneticist, but from what I understand is that the RNA that is uh, translated from the DNA and, and corn is really specific to western and northern corn rootworm. And as that RNA is translated into the pathways and hopefully we're getting gene expression, the RNA, RNAi is an interference, so it blocks those pathways. You're not getting proper protein expression, and basically another word for that would be gene silencing. It's turning off those pathways, and so the larvae cannot completely develop as they would normally. So within five days of consuming the RNAi technology, they're going to stop feeding and die. So you can imagine gene silencing kind of sounds like a little bit of a, a scary term, but basically it's a, a targeted approach at pest management. So my understanding is that the RNAi technology we will always be paired with BT pyramid, so that's CRY 34, 35, AB1, and CRY 3, BB1. So the RNAi will be paired with BT, along with the other genetics that you want for high yielding hybrids. So uh, it's very limited, almost demo type availability for 2021, but it's my understanding that you'll have more access to that in 2022 on a limited basis. Uh, just like anything else, for especially for Western corn rootworm, we want to use it sparingly and only when needed and we don't want to use it all the time because western corn rootworm will adapt and so we want to be using it in those targeted fields where we've had really poor performance in the back in the past and and see how it uh, does on your field so um, those are some of the main strategies that i think about for long-term production crop rotation bt and then give it a try the rnai technology I'd like to thank you for watching our video today on learning a bit more about corn rootworm scouting, thresholds, and management. And so for Ashley, I'm Erin, and we'll catch you next time.